please know that whoever you are and wherever you are in your journey in life, you are welcome here, a place that, where God is still speaking.
and the invocation which you may find in your bulletins. Faithful God, you draw us to your us in our joy and our grief, in our hope and in our despair. When we hear our bow down, you raise us anew. When we turn to you now in search of your healing touch, God of compassion and love, move among us this hour. Open our eyes, dispel our fears, and show us the real life you have to offer. We pray this in the name of the risen one, Jesus Christ. Amen. Wow, it's been a busy last couple of weeks here at the United Church of Christ, Fort Lauderdale. There's been three baptisms and one wedding. It's uh, been very busy. But yesterday at the baptism in our chapel, which is right next door to this room, uh, 20 people gathered. Um, and to watch them gather around the, the child, the infant that was baptized, was an amazing experience to, to see and feel and experience the love that was in the room. And to, after the baptism's, baptism's over, the parents said, here, would you hold the child so we can take a picture? And I said, oh, okay. And I prayed, you guys, you guys didn't, the, the child did not cry, so thank you, God. That really was the most wonderful child ever. But looking into the child's eyes during the ceremony, it reminds me of God. Just looking into this God, you know. The, the love and the, the trust and the faith that the child had in the family and what was going on at the time. Probably thinking, who is this guy splashing water on my head? But no, I think the, the child was very in tune with what was happening at the moment and the love that was in the room. So we're thankful for our children, so let us pray. God, we thank you for the gift of children and we thank you that may we be a good example for them. May they see the light of Christ in us as we see the light of Christ in them. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a reading that is a quote from Mahatma Gandhi this morning. It's simple and yet profound. Happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. The widow of Seraphath. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Seraphath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So Elijah set out and went to Seraphath, and when he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her, saying, Bring me a little water in a vessel, so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me just a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handy full of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. She sinned and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as her and her household are for, ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You've come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. But he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her bosom, carried him up to the upper chamber where he was lodging, and laid him on the bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I'm staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again. 
and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the chamber into the house, and gave him to his mother, and said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you're a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth, and is the truth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Again, an amazing text filled with wisdom, and we'll journey through that now. But first, there was a young man who was very, very excited because, you know what, he won a trip to the Super Bowl. He won a free ticket. So he gets to the Super Bowl and he finds his seat, but he realizes it's in the back of the stadium, up where all the little people look this small, and he was disappointed. But he said, you know what, I see some seats way down there up front. I'm going to go down there and see if I can get one. So he goes down and he's right next to the field and there's an empty seat and there's a man sitting next to it. So he looks at the man and he says, how could someone pass up a seat like this? And the older gentleman responded, he said, that's my wife's seat. We've been to every Super Bowl since the day we were married, but she's passed away. Oh, how sad, the man said. I'm sorry to hear that, but couldn't you find a friend or a relative to come with you? No, the man said, they're all at the funeral. <laughs> but today's lesson, as you can tell from the story, is about commitment. Commitment, and this man certainly was committed, but was he committed in a good and a healthy way? We'll talk about that at the end of the sermon. <laughs> Might want to rethink that that journey. But the story of Elijah and the widow of Seraphat is fascinating, and let's take a look at some of the main characters this morning. And I like Elijah. Elijah is wonderful. His name in Hebrew means "My God is Yahweh." My God is Lord. But in the land he lived in before, he was up against the God. Um, uh, the, uh, there was a place that was worshiping Baal. Now, as told in the Hebrew Bible, Elijah's challenge is bold and direct because Baal was the Canaanite god responsible for rain and thunder and lightning. So it's very important. So that was very important for them living in the desert because they needed rain, they needed the, for sustenance. But not, Elijah not only challenges Baal on behalf of his own God, Yahweh, he challenges Jezebel, the priest, Ahab, and the people of Israel. So as we know from history and his journey, he had a very tough and challenging life. God put a very intense challenge in his path. But after Elijah's confrontation with Ahab, God tells him, all of a sudden he says, flee out of this land and go to a different place, a different land, and to be fed in a different way. Have we ever had that happen to us? Where God has said, you know, we may think we know the path for us, but God steers us in a different way, you know, on a different path, and it's kind of scary. I know I have. And now Elijah just said yes to it because he was committed. Now, Yahweh performed many miracles through Elijah, and as we know through the Scriptures, through raising the dead, bringing fire down from the sky, and taking the prophet up from heaven, you know, by a whirlwind. And the book of Malachi prophesizes Elijah's return before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, making him a harbinger of the Messiah. But there's Elijah, they talk to him throughout the scriptures, and even at the transfiguration, we see Jesus goes up the mountain to pray, and there is Moses with Elijah. The disciples get to witness that. But there's references to Elijah that appear in the New Testament, the Talmud, the Mis and the Quran, all through different faith denominations, many talk about Elijah's journey. But when I think about the word commitment, I think about the prophet Elijah. So in this part of his journey, God sent him among the Phoenicians, the center of Baal worship, to demonstrate that even in the land of Baal, the Lord is sovereign. He sent him out amongst the people that was most challenging in his life to be an example among the Phoenicians. A call to ministry, a call to life. It was an amazing journey for him. 
But June, just last week, there was the 153rd anniversary of someone's journey that had a similar call. Now, um, have you, you're familiar with a person named Harriet Tubman, who was a slave in her journey? Well, this newspaper, newspaper article appeared June 2nd, 1863, 153 years ago last week. And it's about Harriet Tubman. It says, it says, Colonel Montgomery and his gallant band of 300 black soldiers under the guidance of a black woman, Harriet Tubman, brought off near 800 slaves and thousands of dollars of worth of property. It was a glorious consummation. After they were all fairly well disposed of in the charge, they were addressed in strains of thrilling eloquence by their gallant deliverer, to which they responded in a song, There is a white robe for thee. A song so appropriate and so heartfelt and cordial as to bring unbidden tears, the author says. The colonel was followed by a speech from the black woman who led the raid and under whose inspiration it was originated and conducted. For sound sense and real native eloquence, her address would do honor to any man and it created a great sensation. Since the rebellion, she has devoted herself to her great work of delivering the bondman with an energy and sagacity that cannot be exceeded. Many and many times she has penetrated the enemy's lines and discovered their situation and condition and escaped without injury, but not without extreme hazard. Harriet Tubman's calling was to escape slavery in order to free others. Both Harriet and Elijah's calling was to invite others to join them in similar ways to experience both the physical and spiritual freedom. So there we have another Elijah in the form of Harriet Tubman. Amazing that so many years later, but the same call to, to free people from their bondage. So a few weeks ago, we also heard the story of Dorcas, whose calling was to make clothes for the widows and poor. poor. And her, remember when we talked about her, her goal, her call was to bring together the Jews and the Gentiles to be one. So people have callings. And our callings are so similar, we may try to make them different, but they're not. You know, we may think of Elijah as some prophet and lift Elijah up, you know, to something we can never be, but God has a different plan in mind for us quite often. Because even here on Thursday's Ruth Ministry program, in this very room, people come together as one. I mean, I've watched there's 20 to 30 volunteers and some are Jewish and some are Christian and some are atheists and some don't attend church and others attend church here. But you see the people come together as one. And they, they, their mission and their love and their compassion is in work together as one also. So you see that, we witness that here in this very room. And this Saturday, we, uh, our church will have a vote in the Pride Parade, the Stonewall Pride Parade. And think about that calling. That calling is to, to let the community know that we're celebrating, that we're su a supportive church, that we love without condition, that we are there to demonstrate love and compassion, setting an example for others. And the parade celebrates the freedoms which the LGBTQ community and movement has accomplished and remind us reminds us of the importance of staying committed to achieving equality and justice for all. So yet again we have the same thing. Elisha's story being repeated again and again and again. One on one from the from if if you're ever available on a Thursday, I invite you to come and help serve food from that very large window right there. As you Share food with somebody who's looking for food. They're hungry, but they're hungry for compassion and love. To look in their eyes and see the light of Christ is just an amazing experience. So you can be an Elijah. You can be a Harriet Tubman. You can be any of those things. God calls us all to do that. And that invitation is very personal. It's not to someone else. It's not to someone sitting right next to you. It's to you and it's to me to do that. And all it does is it takes a choice to do so. All it does is it takes a choice. Elijah made, made the choice to say yes to God's calling. Harriet Tubman 
decided to say yes to her calling. The people who come here on Thursday say yes to their calling. The people who will march in the Pride Stonewall Parade say yes to their calling. So there's a commonality among all these different people and groups and organizations. So God sends Elijah to this widow living in the town of Seraphat. Now in Phoenicia, she's the other main character we're going to talk about this morning. God sends Elijah to a town on the Phoenician coast, and as I said before, the center of Baal worship. Now when Elijah finds a widow and asks to be fed, she says that I don't have enough food only for my son and myself, and even just enough that we'll eat this and after that we will die. She's lost hope, hasn't she? All sense of hope. But then Elijah appears, and she must have seen something in him. And I do ask that. What did she see in him that made her say yes? She didn't know about him being a prophet, his history, all these things. I doubt that she knew any of that. She saw him. This stranger comes up and says, I would like you to share what you have left the remaining part of your sustenance with me. And she made the choice and she said yes to it. She feeds him the last of the food and Elijah's promise miraculously comes true. She believed in him. She stepped out of the boat. She trusted him. Even though it was a stranger in her land, Do we feel that we get this kind of feedback in our lives? Sometimes we have these challenges that come up and we look to God for an answer and we pray and God may lead us to a path that makes us uncomfortable, yet God clearly answers our prayers and rewards our faithfulness, doesn't He? I know that's happened to me. Many times I wasn't really comfortable and I thought, you know what, I'm stepping out of the boat. I'm going to say yes to it. Only to find that I serve a faithful God. One that's wonderful to me. But what happens in the story, though? She's doing well. She sees the food multiply before her very eyes. But what happens next? Her son dies. Her son dies. So she cries out, Did you come to remind me of my sin? And did you come to kill my son? All of a sudden, her energy and her understanding changes, doesn't it? Why did you come here in the first place? Now, this instance is the first instance of raising the dead recorded in scriptures, too. The widow cried, The word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth, once the child was revived. But we do the same thing, don't we? Sometimes when we have a personal loss, a loss in our lives, we so easily forget you know, our path and our history and our experiences. How many times God proved God's self to us, even though God doesn't need to prove anything. But he was revived because Elijah believed. Think about Elijah's journey. He must have, wow. I mean, the hard times for years he had and the drought and all that. And God sends him and he says, ravens are going to feed you. Ravens, birds. And then that doesn't work out. And there's a widow of the people who oppose him shows up. And he has enough faith to ask her. Didn't ask her, he says, bring me food. Because he trusted in God, didn't he? So what an example for us today. Maybe we're called to do the same. Whenever we feel that God isn't hearing us or we get caught up in our anger, out of our grief or for other reasons, we have to remember that indeed God does hear us. God does. It's at those times we're invited to trust God even more in a more deeper way, at a deeper level. And when we do, we find that our faith grows. Our connection with God increases. We have a choice. We can either drown in our anger and our grief or we can continue to live. A 
coming up in the next week or so, there's going to be a fundraiser. Many of you know Jim Sargent, who's here. Raise your hand. <coughs> Little Jimmy, we call him. <laughs> well, he lost his son, who was 10 years old, to a battle with cancer. <coughs> and they have a fundraiser that talk to Sarge after service. It's where people come and they commit and they shave their heads to raise money. And they people sponsor all the people who are shaved. So Sarge has taken, he said yes to that journey. He said, I want to help raise money for other children that have the same journey. I'll never forget what Sarge told me the day he, he's in the car driving back from the doctor's office and Matthew looks at his dad and says, it's okay, I'm going home. Talk about a commitment, a trust, a faith in God and the Lord. That child has taught us a lot this morning. But I invite you to sign up to support Sarge in his quest. <coughs> but what amazes me the most is Sarge had the right to be bitter and angry. But he relies on his trust and his faith in the Lord every single day. He shares his journey with others to prove that, that God can bring you out of those valleys and those challenges that you need to be able to see the other side continue to trust and to love. Thank you, Sarge, for being such a testimony with your faith and your witness. Because it's so easy to say, God's found in a foreign land, a land called grief, agony, despair, a sense of losing hope. But this journey has brought Sarge closer to God. Not only is it what God would want, it's what Matthew would want. The journey of the widow of Seraphath is filled with wisdom regarding commitment. But it's also a story about hope. Hope from all sides. If you think of all which character when I was reading this, this is which character am I? Sometimes we're the Elijah, sometimes we're the widow, sometimes we are the son. But it's a story about commitment and a story about hope. But as the widow said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm now gathering a couple of sticks, she says, so that we may eat and die. The widow journeys from a place of despair to a journey of hope and trust. Hope, commitment, trust, and faith, they all go hand in hand. And whether your name's Elijah, or the widow of Seraphat, Harriet, Jim, Matthew, we're invited to learn from this book. These journeys that we're, each one of us is on and can share with one another and do so so wonderfully in our present. So commitment is the word of today. The important question to ask ourselves this morning though is God is clear, clearly committed to us. We know that. We can see that. We know that through life experience. But do we make our relationship with the divine the center of our life or do we give God what's left over? Do we profess God's love in the way we live in love? Do we limit ourselves because of self-doubt or fears in our journeys to, to places and experiences so clearly which calls, God calls us to? Or do we let our fear and our doubt win over? We can learn from this journey and this, this story. It's powerful. And there's many testimonies in this church here this morning of the same people who have said yes to it and get to live in that spiritual freedom that Harriet Tubman also demonstrated for us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Treasure that I seek. You are my.